reality here, and it's just about 10 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, even though we should have uh, some more folks joining us as the minutes tick by. So first of all, welcome to OIS. Uh, this is the third meeting that we're doing for uh, parent new student admissions for the 2017-2018 school year. We've uh, presented to parents seeking admission for grade 11. Uh, two days ago, we talked to uh, early years parents for nursery, junior kindergarten, senior kindergarten, and this is our presentation for grades one through five in the primary. We have an agenda. We're hoping to get through this in about 45 minutes or so. One of us might be a little more long-winded than we originally thought. So uh, we found that the optimal amount of time is about an hour. We will allow time for question and answer at the end. So just some quick introductions. My name is Steve Argeri. I'm the deputy head of school. Uh, our head of school is traveling, so you will, you will not be able to see his presentation. You, you get stuck with me for the morning. We have our primary leadership team uh, with us this morning, so I'd like to introduce them, them quickly. Uh, first up is Mr. Tony Batchelor. He's the primary head, and he is a seasoned educator from New Zealand originally. It doesn't mean old, it just means experience. Yes, okay. And next up is Ms. Vina De Silva. She is doing double duty this year as our Deputy Head of Primary and Primary Years Program Coordinator. And then the last person is Ms. Vimy Santos, and she is our Deputy PYP Coordinator. It's a very able team. Uh, the primary school is in very good hands. Uh, so I'm very happy to introduce you to them. So let's begin. So first off, welcome. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a bunch of slides, I'm gonna go through them. The first thing I wanna do is share with you some of the essential facts. We've been in operation since 2008. So this year is our ninth year in, in operation as a school. Uh, next year we'll celebrate year 10. It's a very auspicious year because we're planning to open a second campus in, uh, in our 10th year of operation. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later on. In terms of enrollment, uh, this is our growth over the past nine years. We started with uh, those legendary 38 students in this really big cavern of a building, which was not totally completed in 2008. And then the growth since then has been quite rapid. So we've gotten to a point now where we're just above 1,600 students, nursery through 12. Uh, I've only been here, this is my second year, but uh, in the early years, from what I understand, there were some years where we were adding two, three, four hundred students each year. So it's been quite fast and, um, and, uh, and it's been, uh, and we have a lot of kids in the building today, but we have a very healthy enrollment and that's where we stand now. We're likely to go up to about just over 1,700 students before we consider this building to be full. And most of that growth, actually all of that growth is going to come in the very upper grades. So really our, our understrength classes right now are in 10, 11, 12. As our full classes cycle through the school, we'll fill up those last few um, grade levels at the top. These are how the numbers break down currently. We have about 300 students in our early years program. In primary, we have just under 600. And in secondary, we're currently sitting at 734. And like I said, uh, that's where the growth will occur in the next couple of years. We'll probably go up to just about 800 students. Where do our students come from? They represent 26 different nationalities, but 80% of our students are Indian. Uh, from what I understand, a significant proportion of those students have lived overseas. And so they bring with them uh, a certain amount of international experience, which is wonderful. And then the remaining 20% uh, are expatriate students. And that number is growing. Last year, about 15% of our student body were uh, consisted of expatriate students. This year it's 20, and we expect that number to grow uh, over time as more companies seem to be moving up to, uh, to this area where uh, locating their kids in a school in Gorgau East is more of a reality than it would have been a few years ago. We have 270 teachers on our faculty. They represent 14 different nationalities. Again, about the same proportion as our students, 79% uh, are Indian. And we have a great student-teacher ratio. A lower number is better. Our number is 5.9, so roughly six teachers per student. That number is, that's an average. It's different in different grade levels. 
and then a little bit about our facility, which we, which we love. We think we have a wonderful facility. We think that uh, it's definitely one of the best educational facilities in Mumbai. It's modern and it's purpose built. So uh, as opposed to some schools which have a prior life as something else, our school started as a school. So it's purpose built. Uh, it's a, we have seven floors, but it's the equivalent of an 11 story building. We have a couple double floors, one on the seventh floor, which we're on now. Our fourth floor is double height and our lobby of course is double height as well. And this is a view from the back on our athletic field, which looks like this. I'm told, because I'm American, I don't really know much about these things. I'm told it's a full-size cricket pitch. However, there are some notable obstacles. One is that palm tree. <laughs> and just outside the right edge of the photo is a mango tree. So there are some obstacles to avoid out there. But it's a great thing to be able to have, especially in a city uh, like Mumbai, where things tend to be a little bit cramped. So we make full use of this. Uh, this year, it was off limits until the rains stopped and it had some time to dry out because we try to keep it looking as green as possible. Uh, but we have students that go out for breaks during the morning. Uh, they go out at lunch to run around. We have ECAs, extracurricular activities out there after school, athletics. So we make full use of it. Two swimming pools, one in the early years uh, which I think is accessible to students in the lower grades of the primary. And then, of course, one in the secondary that we also use as a competition venue. So we do host a couple of swim meets with some of the other international schools. They come in and use our pool. And the wonderful thing about it, this is on the fourth floor, uh, it overlooks the dairy. So we get a nice view of it, of the green space from uh, the fourth floor. You're sitting in our 400-seat auditorium which we use for lots of different things, parent meetings, uh, when they're this size, we use it for uh, school productions, musicals and plays and things of that sort, assemblies for our students. It gets quite a bit of use. We're using it for graduation, although we're getting to a point where our graduating class is going to become too large for us to fit all of the graduates and their families in here. And on this floor, just across the way is a multi-purpose hall. It's essentially, it's a gymnasium. Uh, on this side, there's a rock climbing wall. We set it up for lots of different things, badminton, uh, volleyball, basketball. So we use it for lots of, lots of different things. We don't like to compare ourselves to other schools in Mumbai for the simple reason that we feel like nobody does things quite the way we do them. And I'll explain that a bit later. But for sake of comparison, uh, we've been asked in the past how does your tuition compare to other schools in Mumbai? This data is based on last May. Our fees have gone up slightly. Uh, so if we look, uh, we, we're probably right about here right now. But for grade five, uh, Ambani's not listed because it doesn't have an international program. But we are definitely at the lower end of the spectrum compared to the other schools. We also like to point out that Ecole Mondial has two different fee structures depending on whether you're an Indian student or you're an expatriate. So as Neil likes to say, you get the same product if you're an expat, you just pay a lot more for it. And then this is a little bit further down the road for you folks, uh, but in IBDP, which is grade, our grade 11 and 12 program, uh, this is how we stack up against the other schools. Mount Litera doesn't offer IBDP currently, and uh, neither does Ascend. The interesting thing is that this is the first place I've lived where the other schools don't freely share their tuition information with the other schools. Uh, so if you're wondering how we get this information, usually we have a secretary pretend that uh, she's looking to get her student into that school and, and then they give up the information. But uh, this is a closely held secret apparently with a lot of the schools in Mumbai. Interesting. Okay. We are, this is something that we, we like to stress and we, because we're quite proud of it, we are fully accredited. What does that mean exactly? It means that in our lobby, just behind the reception desk, we have a, a bunch of frames on the wall and um, two of those contain our official accreditations from CIS, which is the Council of International Schools, and then also from this NIASC group, which is a US-based accrediting agency called the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. 
So we say that we have dual accreditation, uh, and this is sort of a gold standard among schools. And what it means is that uh, periodically we welcome external teams into the school who literally poke their noses into just about every aspect of what we do. Not just the academics, but also a lot of the operational and non-academic functions. So we are accredited by both agencies. A lot of schools around the world, international schools, may have no accreditation at all, or they may just carry a CIS accreditation. We have both. And just to give you an idea for, I guess, the rarity of this, there are, as of last May, just over 8,000 international schools in the world. Only 451 of them are fully accredited, again, with that dual accreditation. So just above 5%. In India, there's 401 international schools. By some counts, only 10 are fully accredited. Right? So we're in quite rare company. And again, why is this important? Uh, it's a way for us to get a good idea from the outside world how good of a job we're doing. And so every, uh, with CIS and NEASC, now it's gonna be on a five-year cycle. Every five years they send a team of educators in. Uh, we have to spend lots and lots of hours preparing reports. Uh, and then when they visit, we have to show them what we're doing. That what we say we do is what we actually do. And so uh, when they finish with their accreditation, they make commendations. They say, hey, these are the things that you're doing really well. They also make recommendations, areas for improvement. So it's a continuous process. It's not like you get it and then you're done. You're working on this pretty well constantly. In terms of other external programs, uh, we received our authorization for the diploma program in grades 11 and 12 originally in 2009. And then again, every five years they come back in and they look at how we're offering that program, whether or not we're doing things the way they, they need to be done. They came back in 2014, we'll have our next visit in 2019. With PYP, which is the program in grades, well, nursery really up to grade five. Uh, 2011 was our initial authorization. We were evaluated again just last year and then they'll come back again in 2020. And then MYP, which is relevant for a lot of you, uh, this is a program that we started, the middle years program in IB, which covers grades six through 10. And so we started that last year, we became a candidate school with the IB, uh, and we started it in grade six. This year it's in grade six and seven. Next year it'll be six, seven, eight. And then the following year, grade nine, and by 2019, 20, it will be um, all the way through six to 10. So at that point, we'll, we, we will fully be a three program IB school. Okay, a little bit about the brand, since I'm told that this is it's important to talk about the brand. So uh, the brand is, is very good. We're doing quite well. We have thriving programs that are very much in demand, and that's uh, on the basis, I say that on the basis of our enrollment. One other item that's of interest that we're very proud of is that the International Baccalaureate uh, Organization is split up into different regions of the world. So we are a member of the IB Asia Pacific region. A couple of years ago, IB made the decision to, uh, to select one international school in each of the major countries in each of the regions. And so this is the roster for Asia Pacific. So in China, the flagship IB school is the Western Academy of Beijing. In Japan, it's Yokohama International School, NIST in Thailand, ESF in Hong Kong, and so on. And so uh, a couple of years ago, IB Asia Pacific took a look at the over 100 schools that offer the IB program in India and decided that the flagship school in India would be OIS. So that's something we're quite proud of. Uh, and if you're asking, well, what are the benefits of that? It means that we can enter into a partnership with IB uh, for professional development purposes. So this is training of our teachers to be able to offer that program. And in about two weeks time, we're going to host a three-day conference for educators all around India. We're expecting about 400 teachers to descend on OIS for three days. Uh, and over the course of those three days, they will take part in subject-specific workshops, uh, talking about curriculum and assessment and things like that. And we're able to do that because we are the preferred partner school in India with um, IB Asia Pacific. Okay, a little bit about the new school, uh, which doesn't have a name yet. We refer to it as OIS2 
maybe uh, we need to have a better imagination than that. And we will. This is an architectural mock-up of what it looks like. I don't think there's going to be quite that much open space around it. I think there are buildings uh, that, that pretty well surround it. This is on JVLR. So here's our current location on the north side of the Airy Dairy. And you can see the route down the Western Express Highway and OIS2 will be there. Have you, is this news out? Do you yep. know that we're opening a second campus? Yes. Okay, good. A close-up look of that particular corner. Uh, you can see Oberoi Splendor. And then Overoy Prisma is the building that's going up just to the right of Splendor. Maxima, I think, is still a construction site or a big hole in the ground. And if you see that wedge-shaped piece of land just to the right of Prisma, that's where the new school will go. Okay, right on JVLR. And from what I'm told right now, it's about up to the third level, I think. So we're making progress. There are questions about what it's going to be. Uh, some folks wonder if it's going to be a primary campus while well, this will become the secondary campus and really it's going to be an exact copy of what we do here, but in a different location. So we'll start it with, we'll start small, uh, but eventually it will be IB throughout, so it'll be a three program school. It will go from nursery to grade 12, but for next year we'll open in August of 2017 and we'll start with grade levels nursery, JKG, SKG, and then one through four. It will have the same quality that we have here. That's very important to us, not to dilute the quality of what we do. And at OIS, we equate the quality of the school with the quality of the teachers offering the programs or teaching the programs and working with kids. We talk a little bit about results, although it's not the thing that we're most interested in, uh, but we're sensitive to the fact that if we don't address our test results at all, people will think that we're hiding something. So just a little bit, because this is in the future for you all, our diploma program results, uh, our average score, and this is out of 45 total for the IBDP, sits at 33.4. By comparison, the world average is 30.2, which puts us in the 70th percentile. So that means that the average OIS student scores better than 70% of all the students around the world that participate in the IB diploma program. So we think that's pretty good. For students that elect to do the full program, there's a 96.3 pass rate, again very impressive while the world average comes out to just a shade under 81%. The most relevant thing I think for this set of parents though is uh, a standardized test that we give each year called the International Schools Assessment. Now we do this exam uh, over the course of two half days in the fall and we test students in grades 3, 5, 7, 9 on mathematics, reading, and then they do two writing exercises. That test is taken by 73,000 students in over 300 international schools in 80 different countries around the world. So it's a good way for us to benchmark ourselves against a lot of other kids in a lot of different places who also take this exam. What we found in terms of our results, there's a lot of numbers that come out of this when we take it. Uh, the benefit of it is that we can test the kids in the same groups. So the kids that took it in grade three in 2011, when they got up to grade five, they took it again, different test, age, age appropriate. And then they took it in grade seven, again in uh, 2015. So we can see the same group of students as it moves through the school and compare their results. We compare the results to other schools, other schools that match our characteristics around the world. Uh, in 2011, the first year that we took it, we had been open for three years. Our scores were below the world average. But by 2015, which was just last year, uh, we sat well above the world average in all of those different subjects. Not only that, but what we've seen is that every year, our improvement has tracked better than the average improvement of other schools that are like us. So we know that we're on the right track. It's another, I, I guess it's another measuring stick that we use to see just how we're doing. But there's much more than that. Uh, and I think the worst thing a school can do is reduce kids to exam grades and numbers on a report card. And so even though uh, I just presented lots of facts and lots of numbers, this is the portion of the presentation where I want you to understand who it is, who we are, and what we do. And the thing of it is, is that we don't 
it's not in our interest to misrepresent ourselves, to not be honest about the kind of program we run and the kind of school that we run. So, this is morning arrival. Uh, I took this shot the other day. Uh, this is the best part of my day. So my job description tends to be very general, but there's one very specific item on that job description, and it's to be stationed in the lobby between 7.30 and 7.45 every day to greet the students as they come in. And literally, it is the best part of my day. It's the only school I've ever been at where I see kids every morning from nursery to grade 12 who all come to school with a smile on their face, uh, who are happy to be here, and that's extremely important to us because it's very important for us to, for this to be a happy place. We know that happy kids learn better than unhappy kids. We know that unhappy unha teachers teach better than unhappy teachers. So we run it as a happy school. We believe that it should be a warm place, that we try to build relationships with kids because we believe that is part of what aids in, in teaching and learning. This, I'll share this quickly. Uh, we hosted parent-teacher meetings about two weeks ago. The attendance rate for our parent body was, for all grades, was just a shade above 90%, which is something that I haven't seen in the other schools that I've been at. A, a really incredible attendance rate and participation rate from parents. This is an email that was sent to us from one parent, uh, and she just wanted to emphasize the things that she learned on, on parent-teacher meeting day as a result of talking to her child's teachers. So they know and understand my child. They identify her strengths and weaknesses, and have tangible feedback, they're positive, and from what this parent understands from the other kids, this is not just with my child, it's with all of them. A very positive teacher, and they're in the profession out of choice and not out of default. Right? These are the kinds of people that we have in our classrooms that are working with our kids. And it's probably the most important thing that we do, making sure that we have qualified people in the classrooms who are there because they want to be there and they want to work with kids uh, and, and help them be the best that they can be. We want it to be a fun place. This is a shot from one of the musicals that we put on in the last year. We are extremely oriented towards families. Uh, we welcome parents into the school on a regular basis. We're not one of the schools that will stop parents at the school door and say, no thanks, we have it, we'll take it from here, you can go home now. Uh, we have multiple events uh, throughout the course of the year where we welcome parents in, we want them to participate. We realize that the best way to teach kids is to enter into a partnership with parents, right? Because fundamentally, we think that we know more about education than parents do, because this is what we do. But individually, you know more about your kid than we'll ever know. And so we each have different sides of the coin that we need to bring together in order to do the best that we can for our kids. This is one of our curriculum mornings in the primary school. So in sum, we're all about the kids. And we're all about the kids because we know that they're our future. And it's very important that we do the best that we can on their behalf. This is something that's always very sobering to me. I have a two-year-old at home, and when I see this following slide, it makes me a little bit nervous. Because our goal is to fully develop all of these things. And that's a very tall order. We don't prioritize any one of those things more than anything else, but we think all of them are, are of equal importance. And so that's what we work towards. Now, one of the problems that we have, and it's not usually something that we experience in the primary because our program is different, but um, when parents, when their kids get to the upper grades, then it tends to become about different things for them. Namely, it becomes about exam scores, uh, it becomes about college entrance, right? And so they tend to lose sight of the things that we tend to focus on, to focus in on only certain things. And again, I said before that we don't reduce our kids to uh, where they get into college so we can market that. We don't reduce our kids to exam scores, again, so we can market that. We look at all of these attributes and we do our best to develop, to develop all of those in our kids. It's a lot, isn't it? So just to wrap up, this is my part here. So what we think, if you're thinking, well, so okay, so what kind of students do you, do you hope to turn out at OIS? This is what we're working towards. In the future, our students need to be skilled in, beyond, and across disciplines. So we don't look at them doing their 45 minutes of math and then putting on a different hat and doing their 45 minutes of science. 
and then doing their 45 minutes of humanities. We try to make sure that they're skilled in and across disciplines. They can integrate all of those things because it furthers their understanding. They're highly literate and numerate, of course. They're confident, creative, adaptive, and flexible learners. They have to be flexible because they're, the world is changing. It's changing faster and faster and faster. They're risk takers. This is important to us. Uh, a lot of us, when we went to school, we knew that the only time you raise your hand in class is when you know that you have the right answer. You're 100% sure. That's not the approach that we take. Right? So we encourage kids to take a chance, to take a risk, uh, and that if they fail, it's just an opportunity for them to learn. They must be relentlessly curious, cognitively agile, self-starting, self-managing, self-evaluating, networked and collaborative. Uh, we're not looking at a world in which we're going to have one person at one desk doing their own work, oblivious of everything else going around them. Uh, they need to be able to work in teams. They need, need to be able to collaborate. They need to be tech savvy, of course. And so this is what we, this is our goal. These are the students that we try to turn out here. Traditional education, which of those parts do you think exists in a traditional education? It's not too much. It probably looks like this. So really, we're hoping to do all of that. And we think we do a pretty good job of it. OK. That's my part. Did I hit 20? Yes. Good morning. As uh, Steve has introduced me, I am the seasoned one. Um, I'm not sure whether he means seasoned because of the colour of my hair, my age, or the fact that I couldn't get my jacket to do up this morning as well as he could. But uh, I am recently here in, uh, in Mumbai from Germany, where I was the principal of an elementary school in Dusseldorf. Prior to that, I came from that country who you keep beating in cricket. Uh, but I'm looking forward to the All Blacks coming and playing here one day. And hopefully that might be a little bit different for us. So, uh, as Steve said uh, earlier, um, I'm in the primary division here, and I have uh, Lena and Vimy who are part of the leadership team for the primary division. And so just today really for us is all about letting you know about some of the things and maybe trying to answer some of your questions that you might have as you sit here. A few numbers. As Steve said already, we have around about 600 uh, students from grades one to grade five. Uh, over five grades, six teachers of each grade, quite a few nationalities which continue to grow, and we have 117 teachers or faculty members in the, in the area. So for you thinking, okay, we've got that many classes, that many teachers, you're right, there are more, a lot more teachers than there are classes that we have. A number of our classes have two teachers together working, along with a teaching assistant, and we are very much moving towards the idea of a collaborative model of, of teaching and learning. So what are we about? We are a primary years program school um, of the International Baccalaureate. And that means that we are a little bit different to the way that some of us might have been at, uh, at school uh, for ourselves. Can you show me if you have ever, if you are someone who has been to an IB school to be educated? Okay. Have you got children who are already in our school? Uh, a couple? Yeah, okay. Great. Thank you. So uh, the primary years program, Vina is going to talk a little bit more about later. But really what we are here 
in uh, at IAS always is a, it's all about learning and how we learn and that's the big focus so we are always looking at what we're doing the way we do it and why and we keep asking ourselves that question all the time it's interesting that in the last five to seven years we have found out more about how children learn than at any other time and as we find out new things we're looking at how that can work for us in our classrooms so a lot of our um, efforts are looking at how do children learn and what is the best way for them to learn we believe that it is using the framework of the primary years program an inquiry constructivist based approach to uh, to learning but we also think that it's all about having fun these guys here some of our teachers uh, doing some professional development with us um, it's not always huggy and close and uh, friendly like that but fun <coughs> certainly is something that we are all about and we're all about learning together collaboratively so learning from each other you won't find as you walk around uh, the primary school children sitting on their own quietly or silently working if i was to walk past a classroom where that was happening i would be particularly worried i'd be wondering what was going on what i like to see and hear are kids talking with each other huddled around an ipad or looking at a particular problem uh, that they're trying to solve but making lots of noise and the person whose voice we want to hear the most in the classroom is not the teachers because the learning happens as we talk about things and when we argue with each other and we get into conflict situations and we are learning what other people are thinking not what the person up the front is telling you to learn and we're all about developing lifelong learners that's what we want our kids to be ready to go out into the world as someone who is wanting to continue their learning our teachers are all about that as well and they are continuing their learning in whatever way it might look uh, and that's one of the things that we are really uh, passionate about uh, and in the big picture learning is, is what it's all about not teaching but learning so I thought it might be quite interesting for me to be able to read your minds and to answer some of the questions that you might be thinking about hopefully I'm on the right track and my mind reading skills are, are going pretty well uh, but there may be some questions you want to ask later on so first up length of the day fairly straightforward here at 745 and the end of the day is at 2.45. But we continue with learning with, through our extracurricular activities, which could uh, carry on through till around about 10 past four. And the answer is yes, we do. And it's fantastic. The food is wonderful. Compared to what it was like in Germany, where it was all sausage and sauerkraut it's very different here and much tastier and yes we do we have a number of school buses that I'm just learning where they go to they go all over the city uh, and uh, it's quite a job to keep track of where all those routes are mm. no the answer is that uh, it's important for us to know where the children are and then how we're going to move them forward we do not have times when we sit the children down and they all do a test which is the same and uh, if you are thinking that you might want to come here and see percentages and grades then you'll be sadly disappointed because that's not what it's going to be about 
it's important for us to know what the next steps in their learning are. So we are doing a lot of assessment, but we don't test in the same way that I remember testing it when I was at school, and maybe for some of you, where you had to learn all week and then you had to test on Friday, and then on Saturday you forgot it all and you did, had to start all over again the next week. We know that that doesn't work, that testing is not how we learn, but finding where we are at, filling up the gaps, patching them up, and then moving on to the next step is much more effective for children's learning. We do, though, once a year, sit the ISA testing, which Steve talked about earlier. Yeah, we do. We go on trips, we go around the city, we use the facilities that this uh, city has to offer, but we also take children out on residential trips. And at the moment, our grade fives are outside of the city. Uh, they're away for three nights and uh, are looking forward to coming back tomorrow. The teachers are particularly with the thought that there's a long weekend, actually a, a long week coming up for them as well. Yes, we do. Um, English is the language of instruction, and we teach Hindi from grade one through, and then in grades three we experience um, Spanish classes and French classes as well. And we also teach uh, these subjects as single subject specialist teachers. So we have experts in the field who are here to take us through the music and visual arts, the PE, the library, um, a very strong student support team, and we have um, a couple of uh, IT integrators who work with our teachers to integrate IT um, and technology across all of the units that we do. So what are we looking for? We believe that learning is a partnership. We believe that it's a partnership between the home and the school and the child. And so what we're particularly looking for are families who believe in the primary years program, who believe in our framework, the IB framework that we uh, have in the school. And we believe that uh, your support, along with the school and the child's learning, is really, really important. If you buy into a school where you don't believe in the philosophy, it's going to be a really tough time and not great for the child's learning. So for us, it's really important that the families who want to come to this school are all about supporting the learning of their children in the primary years program. And I will now pass you over to Vina, who has a lot more experience in this area, and she's going to tell us a little bit about what the program looks like. It's interesting to see how things don't change over time. Parents come in, look at the seats for seats that are empty, and choose the back seats. <laughs> so that's nice. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the primary years program. Um, the model that you see here, sorry, it's a little blurred, but um, is what the IB framework is. And we use this framework to design our own curriculum. So no two IB schools will specifically have the same curriculum. Okay, but the framework will pretty much look like this. Uh, the framework is based on five essential elements, that is the knowledge, concepts, skills, attitudes, and action. And we believed in concept-based curriculum, and the transdisciplinary themes in the framework allow us to do that. The themes are broad enough, so they help us weave different subject areas into it. So unlike other schools, we wouldn't have like a history, geography, science textbooks, but it's all taken care to the transdisciplinary themes. Um, we are inquiry-based, 
So that means even our math will look something like this. We communicate with our parents through the blogs. Um, a lot of digital communication is done between the parents, so you're not going to see worksheets. There are hardly going to be any worksheets. Like Tony and uh, Steve mentioned, there's going to be a lot of noise, a lot of chaos. Um, your children will come home and ask them, what did you do today? And they will probably say, we did no math today. We just had fun. And then the parents freak out, and it goes on WhatsApp. Okay, so this is, these are some pictures how our classrooms will look like. Again, we emphasize a lot on concepts. Concepts make our learning more deeper than just wider. Okay, so I would just like to quickly throw an example. So if you're looking at the concept of symmetry, which subject areas you think we can explore through these concepts? Geometry, perfect. Arts. Architecture, arts, anything else? Biology, there you go. Okay, so we are not going to tell you we are teaching them art or geometry, but we are going to tell you that we're focusing on the concept of <coughs> symmetry. So our art teacher would do something on symmetry, our PE teachers would do something on balance and symmetry. So it's very much concept based. Collaboration. Okay, we constantly group and regroup our students. We group and regroup them depending upon their interest, depending upon their readiness levels, and sometimes it's random grouping. So yes, one boy has to work with three girls. Okay, we don't have a choice. Um, so collaboration, action, very important for us. Um, we are looking forward for students to extend their learning take meaningful actions. Today, this morning when I entered in, a grade three student was really upset. They're learning about a unit on exploration. Comes and tells me, Miss, can we find out why Baikala Zoo has a penguin in it? <laughs> a, I didn't know. And do you know it's dead now? Yeah. So that is an issue she wants to explore. Okay, and I'm not going to that time say, we are not studying about this unit. Sorry, can't do anything about it. Okay, so she's going to inquire more into it. She's talking about doing petitions and all of that. So action is something that we deeply believe in. Our parents generally ask us, tell us how we can help our children at home. Give us the book that I can buy. Give us the worksheets that I can buy. And we'll be like, no, talk to your children. Expose them to real life situations. Talk about the concepts. This is how we want you to really help us. Again, going back, it's not only about academics. We strongly believe in social and emotional development. Um, we are, we have wonderful bunch of parents at our school. Our grade one children were doing food to table. They are cooking every single day. Um, they know pasta comes from wheat flour, but a parent actually bought wheat and they didn't know how wheat looked like, okay? Uh, where does the chocolate milk come from? Can you guess the answer? Six-year-old, what would you say? Brown cow. <laughs> okay, so we take the children from what their knowledge base is and then build them. And like Tony and Steve mentioned, we believe in that partnership. And we've had parents getting all their cooking appliances and we're cooking for a week. Um, Yes, we do believe in developing internationally minded students. We do that through our learner profile. We encourage student questions. Asking questions is the most important trait we want in our students. Being a mother of eight year old, sometimes really at the end of the day you want to say, please, can you keep quiet? <laughs> yes, but at the presentation, yes, I'm going to say we really, really encourage them to ask questions. The role of the teacher, we don't claim that we know everything. Um, we are facilitators, we are motivators. We don't believe we are the sage on the stage or the guide on the side, but we are really ready to be among the students and learn. So we are really the meddlers in the middle. Okay, so sometimes your kids are going to come home and say, I asked a question to my teacher, 
And she says, I don't know. We've really worked hard with our parents for that, okay? And uh, we are all parents on WhatsApp, so again, WhatsApp really educates us. Um, so just these few slides give you a snapshot about how our classrooms really look like. Again, no homework, no worksheets, questioning is something that we really emphasize on, and spellings is not the only level of intelligence. So spellings is something that's least on our priority. Yeah? Yeah, let me just, I'll just jump in for two minutes on the, um, the process. I think when we did this for early years, this is where most of the questions came. What's the process? <clears throat> so we're taking inquiries for admissions until October 28th. Uh, and then from what I understand, uh, we'll be selling application forms. Uh, to go from inquiry to sale, it's a computer-based random selection. So obviously we have more uh, parents who inquire than we have space for, so we, uh, we resort to random selection to uh, get to the next stage. Uh, so purchase of application forms will start, I'm told, on the 28th. There may be a couple days with the holiday where we move that a little bit. Completed applications, we're looking at November 7th. Again, that may move a day or two either way. And then uh, once you fill out the application, then you'll be scheduled for an interaction. Uh, so it's essentially a, an admissions interview. We send the children to one place to work with teachers on a variety of tasks. They don't sit and take a math test. They don't sit and do a writing exercise. They, <clears throat> excuse me, work with each other. They collaborate, they talk and tell stories and things like that. Uh, and then the parents will take part in a separate interview. And then we're looking for uh, decisions to be made and communicated to you by early January, okay? One question that came up, especially with the new school, how does that factor into the admissions process? Uh, we're certainly very clear that primary here is nearly full. There are very few spots currently available. We know that we'll have students that deregister, that move for a variety of reasons, so we know that some spots will open up but well, really what we're looking at is the, um, the majority of the spaces, easily the majority of the spaces in primary, will be at OIS2. And approximately, just to give you an idea, we're looking at starting the school, I said nursery through grade four. Uh, we're looking at at least a couple of sections, a couple of classes per grade level. 